encrypting secrets through the discussions using games v2 so we have swarup and chirag swarup is a, is a software engineer at red hat who currently works on developing scalable programs for red hat open shift container platform chirag is a software engineer at red hat working with open shift customer focused engineering team on various things related to the open shift container platform welcome to you guys over to you uh, hello everyone good afternoon thanks for joining here today for this talk um, i hope you guys have uh, great lunch um, i have i like the food so my name is chirag kyal um, and join me with uh, my friend and colleague swarup ghos uh, we both are uh, working at red hat at software engineers uh, we basically work in open shift engineering team Uh, so today we are going to discuss about encrypting secrets in kubernetes cluster using kms okay um before i go too deep into the discussion um, let me ask you a couple of questions so how many of you guys are using kubernetes secret i hope most of you right okay how many of you are using in in a production cluster a couple of you um are you managing your secrets securely in the production cluster or ever come across questions like how can i securely manage my secrets uh, whether my secrets are secure or not if you ever come across uh, this questions i hope this talk can help you understand uh, bits and pieces of that so without or further ado let's get started so first i will start with uh, some basics of kubernetes secret so so anything that is sensitive uh, be it credential um, your username password token api keys so if you wanted to use and store such kind of sensitive data inside your kubernetes cluster then uh, kubernetes has this awesome mechanism of kubernetes secrets uh, where you do not have to include your uh, you do not have to include any of your sensitive data directly inside your container images rather you can reference this secrets during runtime uh, inside your container uh, be it as an environment variable or uh, you can use any file system mount and you can mount your kubernetes secrets directly to your containers at runtime so this is the advantage of using kubernetes secret so whenever you try to create any secret what happens is that your api server gets a request it uh, reads that request and store your secret as a key value pair inside its database that is scd so inside scd all your secrets are getting stored as a key value pair so with this setup i hope uh, everyone is happy here like uh, your api server is happy it has stored your secrets inside scd your container is happy because it is getting all the secrets from there you are also happy do you feel like uh, there is some problem with this setup i feel there it is there is some security problem with this default setup because by default kubernetes store all the secrets as unencrypted format inside the scd database so if you try to visualize what is there inside your scd database using some scd ctl tool you will get to know that all the secrets inside it are getting stored as a plain text format they are not encrypted okay that is the default implementation that kubernetes has so if any attacker by any chance get to get uh, get the access of your scd database they can basically gain all the sensitive data that is present inside it and they can happily create a backup of your scd database and walk away with all the sensitive data that is present inside that so all your sensitive data all your username password be it anything get compromised or can get leaked with the default implementation so that is that is the problem of the default implementation of uh, kubernetes that secrets are not encrypted by default so what is the solution for this problem i hope you might have guessed it right looking at the picture at the right hand side that you need to encrypt your secrets at rest inside the hca database okay now uh, if you search kubernetes documentation uh, that how can i encrypt my secrets you will land this page and you will see kubernetes is giving different types of encryption providers like aes cvc aes gcm kms v1 v2 there are quite a few these 
encryption providers are basically classified into two types. One is called as local encryption provider, and another one is called as remote or external encryption provider. I will I'll go a bit deep into these uh, topics. First, let's discuss about uh, local encryption provider. So uh, in, in order to use any encryption provider, you have to use something called as encryption config. OK, so this is a configuration YAML that basically sits inside the API server. And it instructs the API server how to encrypt any secret. Uh, how it does is that uh, you need to add this encryption uh, configuration YAML inside the SA database. And you have to write all the configurations, like which provider you wanted to use. So for local encryption, you can choose between AES, GCM, AES, CVC, secret box, doesn't matter which one you are picking. So along with that provider name, you have to give keys. So these keys uh, are basically used uh, by the API server to encrypt all the secrets. So uh, now what happens when you do kubectl create secret, your API server reads this encryption configuration YAML. It uses that encryption key that is basically present inside that configuration YAML and stores your secret as encrypted format inside the HCD database. OK? Now, during decryption or when you do kubectl get secret, the reverse process happens. Uh, your API server get the uh, encrypted secret from the HCD database, uses the same encryption key that is present in the configuration YAML and decrypts uh, the secret and give it back to you. OK? So this is, this is the mechanism of uh, local encryption provider. Till now with me, uh, any question with local encryption provider? All right. So local encryption provider, it mitigates one major concern, that is the HCD compromise problem, because all the secrets inside your HCD is now encrypted. So if any attacker, even if they try to get uh, access to your HCD database, they won't get much out of it, because all the secrets are encrypted now inside that. But it doesn't mitigate one major problem, that is your host compromise problem. Think about this way. Uh, Sup suppose your attacker uh, tries to gain the access of the host itself, or they get the access of your um, disk of the node where your API server is running. What will happen is that they will get the, they will get the encryption key. You see over here, that is uh, the encryption key that is present inside your uh, configuration YAML. So they can easily grab that encryption key, take a backup of your HCD database, and happily encrypt, decrypt all the secrets. So now your secrets are again compromised. So local encryption provider, it mitigates one major problem, that is HCD compromise problem, but it doesn't mitigate the host compromise problem. So to mitigate both the problems, we have something called as uh, KMS envelope encryption, or uh, using the external encryption provider. First, uh, let's discuss about what is KMS. So KMS stands for key management system or service. So it is an automated system provided by all the major cloud providers uh, to automatically manage your cryptographic keys and its metadata. So all the major cloud providers like GCP has their cloud KMS, uh, Azure has their Key Vault, uh, then AWS has their AWS KMS. So all the major cloud providers have their own flavor of KMS. This KMS uh, uses something called as envelope encryption. How many of you guys know about envelope encryption? No? OK. So in case of envelope encryption, there are two types of keys. One is called as DEKs, that is data encryption key. And another one is called as KEK, that is key encryption key. So in case of envelope encryption, uh, your data are basically getting encrypted using the data encryption key. After encrypting your data, uh, your DEK goes to the remote KMS server, get that DEK encrypted using the Key, key encryption key, that is KEK, get a ciphertext back and store that encrypted DEK along with the encrypted data inside your disk. 
So this is how the flow works during the encryption for your uh, envelope encryption provider. During decryption, the exact reverse process happens. So um, your encrypted DEK goes to the remote KMS server, get it decrypted from there, and using that decrypted DEK, it basically decrypts all the data. So you see, uh, with uh, envelope encryption, the advantage is that your key encryption key never gets stored along with your data. It always present inside some external remote server. So your, uh, your attacker cannot get uh, the access of KEK because that is backed by all the cloud providers. So that, is, that acts as a uh, root of trust. Now uh, let's see how uh, you can use KMS uh, in case of Kubernetes. So in order to use KMS, you need to, uh, you need to have something called as KMS plugin. So this basically acts as a bridge between your API server and uh, the external KMS. It's an gRPC server that basically uh, talks to your API server and the KMS. Now what happens when you do kubectl create secret, your API server sends a signal to the KMS plugin. KMS plugin then generates a DEK. So that DEK basically used to encrypt the data. Once the data is encrypted, KMS plugin talks to the cloud KMS, decrypt that DEK using the KEK that is present inside the KMS service, get a ciphertext back, and writes the encrypted DEK along with the encrypted secret inside the HCD. So you see your encryption key, that is your KEK never writes, never get uh, written inside the HCD database. It always present uh, outside, uh, inside, uh, outside uh, to your cluster. Okay, um, so using uh, your external secrets provider or KMS, uh, we can mitigate both the security problems that I have been talking about. It mitigates the HCD compromise problem and it also mitigates the host compromise problem. Now, uh, Sorup will uh, discuss about uh, the architecture of KMS. Uh, well, Chirag, explain to you about the different encryption providers that you get with Kubernetes these days. So basically, we are at a point where we have an understanding that an unencrypted secrets are anyways not a good idea. And if you move one step forward, when you move to something like a local provider, a local encryption provider, you have the risk of uh, getting your um, ho uh, like host compromised and still you get attacked onto your secrets. So we are here with KMS encryption provider where uh, the keys are stored remotely in some remote location managed by the cloud provider. Or you can also use your, uh, what would I say, like a custom key management solution running on a bare metal kind of a setup within your environment where you can manage the keys securely and keep it as like uh, isolated from your actual control plane and your actual cluster. So let's dive deep into what happens when uh, we use Kubernetes KMS and I'll also walk you through a demo with it, how it, uh, how it looks like. Uh, so, um, so as we see that there is a lot of encryption and decryption going on and, uh, and at a very high level there's API server, etcd and in between them there's a new, uh, new agent, it's called KMS plugin. The KMS plugin's uh, job is to talk to the KMS provider and ensure that keys are encrypted and decrypted when the API server wants to, that's all the plugin does. So the uh, communication essentially happens over a gRPC connection. So typically you would run the plugin as a static pod or, uh, or, as a, or as a, like on the host itself, any way you want. Basically what QAPI server needs from the control plane is a unique socket where it can communicate with the plugin and make those encryption decryption calls. Uh, and if you see this uh, representation where the secret is uh, uh, where the secret is getting stored in etcd it is uh, getting stored in uh, format where it's encrypted and it's uh, and it's safe for anyone to like whoever has access to the disk or those kind of things they still cannot get the actual secret itself so moving on uh, we have two implementations of kms in kubernetes as of today one is the v1 implementation which has existed for quite some time 
and there is V2 as well, which we will discuss later on. So V1 has been there for quite some time. Uh, I think, uh, yeah, V1.10 or V1.13, I don't remember. Yeah, uh, and the new V2 is there from V1.27 onwards. It's available as a beta. Uh, well, I walk you through what happens when you create a secret using V1. So there's a client that tries to create, uh, talk to API server to give it the d contents of the secret. Usually it's base64 encoded. Even if it is not, if you use the new string data field, uh, if it's not base64 encoded, the API server receives it. If required, decodes it from the normal base64 to the, no uh, to the normal string. And what it does is it randomly generates a number, which we call the DEK, or the data encryption key. This DEK will be used to encrypt the secret. So this DEK, uh, this DEK will be uh, ciphered upon the actual secret itself, and you will get an encrypted secret which will be stored on the disk. So on the disk, two things are stored. One is the encrypted secret itself, and this DEK is also sent to that KMS plugin, which sends uh, encrypted DEK back. And once the encrypted DEK is available, the encrypted DEK along with the encrypted secret is stored, uh, uh, stored on your etcd. Another good part is that your secret ac and its actual, uh, actual contents doesn't leave the node. So it doesn't go to KMS. This is why envelope en encryption is helpful. Um, apart from that, there is also another interesting bit, which is the, if you see over here, this is the cache size. This cache size you can configure from your end when you are configuring the encryption provider. What it will basically do is whenever making these uh, encryptions uh, happen, they will also cache the DEK's uh, encrypted, uh, like the plain text DEK as well as the encrypted DEK, keep a mapping. It's essentially an LRU cache. Uh, what it helps to do is uh, avoid, uh, like, uh, avoid or like I would say decrease the number of KMS calls later on when we use it for decryption. Uh, it's up to you if you want a very secure setup where you do not want anything to be running on the memory itself. You can use something like cache zero, but that's uh, that would add a lot of network overhead between KMS plugin and your API server. And um, uh, we could just make a note that for this particular KMS v1, there's a one DEK for each secret. So. When we decrypt it, the etcd data is uh, read, and basically you get the encrypted, de encrypted DEK and the encrypted secret. So when you get the encrypted, uh, encrypted secret, uh, sorry, when you get the encrypted DEK, you send it back to the KMS plugin to get the plain text DEK, use it to decrypt the encrypted data and give it to the client. If it is available in the cache, you save yourself from, uh, I mean, Cube API server saves itself from the, uh, from the extra KMS plugin call it had to made. Depends upon what is the cache size and how the cache works. So this is how it works at a high level. I'll also walk you through V2. So things change in V2 a bit. Uh, it's, uh, it's basically tries to reduce the number of calls to KMS that's happening and also the total number of DEKs that get generated. So before in KMS v V1, what used to happen was we used to have that many number of DEKs as the number of secrets. But now, usually when the API server starts up, it creates one DEK and caches it. So it doesn't create one DEK per, uh, per uh, secret anymore, but it only does this when it is required. Uh, by, by when it is required, I mean that this happens on API server startup and if the KMS key is rotated. So if the KMS key is rotated, this is how it will go on. If not, then uh, uh, if it doesn't get rotated, then the DEK will remain the same. Internally, the cache is a time-limited cache, so after a point of time, it does talk to KMS again, but shouldn't be a problem since it's just one key or maybe two, three keys, so yeah. So essentially, you see now the flow is simpler. You, uh, when you create a secret, you need not make a KMS plugin call. You have the DEK available in the cache itself, that one particular DEK. Use it to encrypt the secret and store it in the uh, at CD, DB. That's it. Uh, the, another difference is if you check out the representation on the data, uh, HCD data itself, previously it used to append the DEK and the uh, encrypted secret. Now it uses a protocol buffer, so you can also store other information like annotations and anything that the KMS plugin provider provides with you. But you shouldn't be concerned about these from a cluster administrator perspective until and unless you are uh, developing a KMS plugin yourself. 
uh, th there's this field, the key ID. This is changed only when the KMS's master key is rotated. So KU API server gets a signal that the, mm, uh, that the master key for the KMS has changed. And now it is time for me to, uh, to re-encrypt everything, basically. Same thing when we have the secret uh, being read from the KMS v2. What happens is it takes the it takes the data from the uh, it already has the DEKS plain text version in the cache, so it doesn't need to make a plugin call. It will just directly use it and decrypt it from etcd and give it back to the user. If there's a key ID change, it will perform reencryption. Okay, so we'll move to the more interesting part uh, to the demo. I hope you can see my screen. So what I did is I created a cluster, uh, not a cluster, a single node Kubernetes uh, VM, uh, a VM where single node Kubernetes is running using QVDM. Nothing special. Mm. If you ch check, so I'll just show you what you need to actually change to enable this uh, KMS thing which I told you. So mm, Kubernetes, uh, would store its static pod manifests in this URL, uh, in this uh, directory, etc Kubernetes manifests. You can check the Kube API server pod YAML from here if you want. Mm, yes, pretty much this one. So this doesn't have a flag encryption provider config yet. I will give one of that to this, and I'll also add another static pod which will run that KMS plugin. So, so I already have these things stored. Yeah, so this is my updated Kube API server uh, static pod. Mm, what it has add on is this last line over here. This encryption provider config. I'll also show you what's in this config. Yeah, this is what is basically there in the config, the path to the Unix uh, socket and the cache size. This is KMS v1. So uh, this is where it should be running. And for this to run, I will uh, spin up another static port. So I'll quickly copy this. And if I restart kubelet, my, my Kubernetes should now start using KMS. OK. Yeah, not an issue. Now what I will try to do is. Yeah, we have them running. OK. Yeah, this is using the older. Just give me a minute. This is an older cube config running at my end, which will not work. Yep. So. I think it should work now. Yeah, so this is, so what I will show is create a secret. Yeah, I'm trying to create this secret, generic uh, generic secret DB user pass, just some dummy values, uh, admin and password XXY, whatever. So this went through KMS internally. I will show you that. So if, Yeah. 
so this if you see this is not the plain text secret this is some encrypted and if i do a hex dump over it it will give a better uh, like a better um, better representation of it basically but yeah uh, this is what is contained inside the um, inside the secret i'll also show you another uh, secret that was there from before which is not encrypted and how it looks like Uh, this is this bootstrap. Mm. Uh, I think I messed up with the. Uh, Okay. Oh yeah, this should be cube system. Yeah, you see this secret is there as plain text from whatever was there in the API server. So this is the difference essentially from KMS and without KMS. Uh, so uh, this is how it works if you do manage your cluster from your end and you have access to the control plane. Uh, what happens is uh, what happens is there can be scenarios where your control plane is managed by someone else for something like uh, for something like managed services you can use gke aks that has off the fly kms encryption that is one alternative apart from that if you have some tooling on top of it which manages the control plane uh, which manages the control plane for you you would typically need to change the kube api server manifest through code whatever tooling you use and add a container for that kms plugin Mm. KMS plugin and change that encryption provider config from inside, and it should work. It should look something similar to this basis of GCP or uh, AWS wherever you are running. So this is uh, this is the basic change that you need to do to your Kube API server if you want to do it in a managed kind of an environment where there's a control plane manager and those kind of thing. So right now this feature is not there within OpenShift, but we are actively investigating how we bring this in. But you can definitely use it on a regular Kubernetes cluster, on AKS, on EKS, on GKE. And if you are running something on a, and if you are running something on a bare metal kind of a uh, bare metal kind of a deployment, what you could do is you could uh, you could directly use a, another KMS pl uh, KMS provider. That's called uh, that's called Truso. That's a that's a, not that's not a KMS provider. My bad. That's a KMS plugin that connects to Vault. So if you're running a Vault internally in your uh, bare metal or in your network, you can uh, you can essentially use Truso KMS plugin that will connect to Vault very well and would r run very well for your bare metal bare metal clusters. Uh, we discussed a lot about securing and uh, securing and encrypting Kubernetes secrets using KMS. But what if you are doing trying to do something things differently, and you want to, uh, and you still want to like use security, or just just to discuss on the other approaches that you get? So HashiCorp Vault has a Vault sidecar injector that injects the um, secrets into the containers uh, into the pods directly through a sidecar container. There's no involvement of Kubernetes as such, uh, the Kubernetes API server as such, but it's secure because it directly talks to Vault and bypasses Kube API server. External secrets operator, this one is more like a synchronization point between an external system or an external API where your secrets are stored and then it injects the Q into Kubernetes secrets. Sealed secrets is another thing. It's similar to uh, KMS, but it works a little bit differently. That is, it actually changes the original secret itself, and there's a uh, controller running that decrypts it at runtime. So even if you run on a GitOps environment or something, if you are using a public GitOps, uh, public Git repo, uh, if you are using sealed secrets, you can keep your secrets even on GitHub. It's, it seals and keeps your uh, encryptions running that way. It's that safe. So yeah, thanks. Pretty much that's what I had, we had. And uh, if you want to contact us, uh, we have our handles on the screen. And I would, be, um, I would give you the opportunity to like question back whatever you want or relating to whatever we discussed today. Any questions?
detailed presentation. So there is one question that I have is like, we have a similar scenario and uh, what we did is we actually used the external secrets operator mm -hmm. to resolve that issue. Uh, so I kind of don't understand like where or what kind of use cases this KMS based stuff will be useful. And uh, because the external secrets also, you know, it connects to the cloud provider secret itself and then get it synchronized and, uh, you know, store it in a secure way. Yeah. So external secret providers do not encrypt your secret. So it just creates a synchronization between uh, your storage, uh, your remote storage and reads uh, your uh, secret from there and creates a Kubernetes secret itself inside your cluster. So it's, it's creating a secret only and it's uh, creating a synchronization, but it is not encrypting any of the secret. So okay. if, even if you are using the external secrets provider, your secrets are not encrypted. They are just synchronizing between the external uh, remote server and your Kubernetes cluster. Got so it. if you do the hex term of your HCD database, you will see the secrets are still plain text. They are not encrypted. Okay, thanks. HTTPS mode only na, so it will be automatically uh, automatically will be synchronized. Uh, that means secure na. So you are saying while doing the synchronization, it it, it won't be a it kind of a plain text. But in HTTPS mode, if I am getting from the external part, it will automatically. But at rest inside the ACD database, it is not. During transition, it could it can be um, uh, encrypted. I am talking about at rest uh, what is happening inside the cluster. If uh, external secrets uh, operator will create a secret itself, and that secret will be stored inside the HCA database only. The problem is, inside the HCA database, it is plain text. Inside HCD, it is not encrypted. So external secrets provider won't solve the uh, encryption and decryption problem. We are we are uh, this entire presentation is for rest. Inside data SCD, the data that is present inside the SCD that is not encrypted. Entire presentation is talking about uh, at rest uh, problem. Uh, also, another thing like if uh, that is uh, not the solution you're looking for, you can also consider encrypting your nodes. That does some point of the exercise that we are doing. But yeah, uh, nothing. It doesn't touch anything at cube level. Is another thing. You can encrypt your nodes disk. Basically, it offers similar kind of a encryption, but doesn't always work. Uh, if you have multi-tenant workloads or some kind of a thing, then it doesn't work. For a multi-tenant workload, like each tenant can have their own KMS plugins and those kind of things. So, if yeah, you thanks. are using uh, OpenShift cluster, uh, we are sorry. Uh, it's it's not uh, it's not launched yet. Uh, internally, we are working heavily to get it uh, GA'd and beta version. So just uh, bear some time uh, to get it uh, released in OpenShift. It's a first line of encryption. So it is a kind of pseudo random number generator which you have. And on top of it, KMS is there. So what if the cache is invalidated? So how do we retrieve the actual secret out of the KMS? So from KMS we cache. So that uh, DK is there, which is in the node or the cluster. Okay? So that is used as the first line of encryption on the secret. And then the secret is shared to the no, secrets are not shared to the KMS. The DEK is shared to the KMS. The DEK goes to the KMS, get it encrypted, and stored with the encrypted secret inside the SA database. Your secret never goes to the remote KMS server. Only the DEK goes to the remote KMS server, get it encrypted, and stores uh, along with your uh, encrypted secret. So if your cache is, uh, so you can you can configure your cache size. So if your cache is zero, so your API server will then talk to the KMS plugin. So KMS plugin won't find any cache. It will talk to the uh, your remote KMS and pick uh, the decrypted DEK from there. So the, your cache is null, right? Your cache is nothing. So you have uh, the KMS plugin have to uh, go to the KMS service again and again. So there will be latency issue that we talked about for K, uh, KMS v1. And the KMS v2 solves that problem. Because Basically, KMS the v2. cache will stay in the memory. It will not leave the node again. So, yeah. so that is the main point. Your cache is... Just for is the LRU lifetime cache. of the API server process. Not your disk. If you have more questions, maybe we could take it offline. Yeah. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, guys. Uh, in the interest of time, we'll take the Q&A off stage. And so I request money to give away the token of appreciation to Chitagans for Please go.